And welcome everyone this evening. We're going to talk about uh, stall spin awareness, part one in the MindStars Maintaining Aircraft Control series. And what I'd like to do is kind of break the talk into several different pieces. I'm going to initially start with some historical perspective to see where we came from uh, in aviation and where we're going. Also want to talk a little bit about a, an interesting FAA study that's kind of driven some of the training uh, over the last couple of decades. And then we'll do a stall review. Uh, we'll also go into the differences between spirals, stalls, and spins. And then review the recovery procedures for spiral stalls and spins. And initially I want to start where it all began for us, and that's with the Wright Brothers a historic first flight. And when we talk about the Wright Brothers, we typically talk in terms of the achievement of powered flight, human-powered flight. And uh, unfortunately, the Wright brothers didn't really view their achievement in, in those terms. They, they saw the primary problem they had to solve was one of balance and control. So really their legacy or their gift to us was a controllable flying machine. And unfortunately, Ever since then, pilots have been finding ways to lose control. And so hopefully through this series and this uh, webinar tonight, we have the opportunity to maybe regain some of that control back. Let's so move ahead to 1912. Some of you may be familiar with Park's dive. Wilfred Park was a British test pilot. And at the time, he was returning to his aerodrome uh, over in Great Britain having just broken an endurance record, and of course records were falling almost daily back then, and he was flying an Avro-type G biplane, which you see uh, on the screen here. One of the things you might notice is there really was no such thing as forward visibility in this airplane, it's all from the side. So as uh, Park came back from his uh, flight, there were a lot of people gathered below to welcome him back and, uh, and celebrate the achievement. He started spiraling down for landing. And en route during that spiral, the airplane suddenly, and unexpectedly at least uh, uh, for Park, entered a spin. And the prevailing wisdom at the time, even though nobody had up to that point recovered from the spin and lived to talk about it, was if you ever encountered the situation, the first thing you do is uh, put the power full on, uh, hold the elevator full aft, and then keep the rudder fully applied in the direction you're going, which, of course, Wilfred was doing and the airplane continued to spin unabated. And of course, we know now, this might seem silly uh, at this time, but we know certainly those are absolutely the wrong things to do. But he did what the, what the prevailing wisdom was at the time. But eventually he saw it wasn't working, and he could feel that there was a force pushing him sideways in his seat. So he let go of the control wheel, braced himself against the uh, uh, fuselage uh, tubing in the airplane, straightened himself out in the seat, stepped on the opposite rudder, and lo and behold, the airplane popped out of the spin, eyewitness reports say, 50 feet above the ground. Now, after such an experience, you might imagine a little bit rattled, so he indeed flew away and tried to recompose himself. And even though uh, this product had not been yet invented, uh, had it been available, no doubt that uh, Wilfred Park would have been a customer at the moment. So anyway, after he was... Uh, done recomposing himself, he came back and he landed the airplane. And because there were a lot of other dignitaries in and around the aerodrome at the time, and we had finally somebody who survived this type of scenario, they all huddled together in one of the hangars and they had a very long discussion about what was going on inside the cockpit, what did Wilf Wilfred Park feel and do, what did the, um, the pilots of the time who were on the ground, what did they observe from the air? And the result of all of this was basically the first published spin recovery procedure uh, that was embedded in a very long article that appeared in the British magazine Flight, uh, which had not only a recount uh, and a conclusion, but it had some diagrams shows where, where the spin occurred as it came on down and then some uh, diagrammatic stuff with the airplane and what was going on. And quite insightful, what came out of this and was published in that paper was that the entire phenomenon was related to elevator and rudder action only. And not only is this uh, insightful, but they were 100% correct uh, in regards to the role of the elevator and the rudder in terms of stall and spin departures. Well, if we kind of uh, fast forward a little bit, 1936, NACA, which was the forerunner to NASA, a test pilot by the name of W.H. McAvoy, 
uh, based on several years of spin research in the U.S. and a spin test program in which McAvoy was involved that involved more than 900 different types of spins in an airplane similar to the one you see in the picture here. And the result of all of this was a technical note, number 555, titled Piloting Technique for Recovery from Spins. And so this was kind of the first here in the U.S. formal research project, long-term, and the results. And a lot of the spins that they were doing were aggravated spins and prolonged spins, developed spins. So basically the recovery advice was from a, a worst case type scenario. And the essence of it was with power off and ailerons neutral, briskly apply the full opposite rudder. After about a half a turn, and again, these are from fully developed and aggravated spins, briskly move the elevator forward. And so this became kind of the standard spin recovery procedure. Uh, several decades later, NASA would revisit a spin test program with general aviation airplanes, light airplanes, and perform more than 10,000 spin turns to confirm that what was uh, recommended in 1936 based on their observations was still true. And in fact, uh, still true, power off ailerons neutral, apply the opposite rudder, briskly move the elevator control forward. And this is known as the NASA standard spin recovery procedure. Uh, NASA even refers to it as the tried and true method. So nothing really has changed over the decades and we have confirmation uh, several de decades after this was first published. Well let's jump ahead to 1976 and now talk about the uh, landmark FAA study. FAA undertook a general aviation stall awareness study to see if they could do things that might improve the stall and spin uh, accident rate, the loss of control that ultimately results in stalls and spins. And what they did was they put together a, a, a program that involved two airplanes that were representative of the types of airplanes that were on flight lines across the U.S., the ubiquitous Cessna 150 and, and the Piper uh, Cherokee 140. And perhaps many of you in the audience have had an opportunity to fly one or both of these airplanes, maybe even learned in these airplanes. So fairly typical of the the training flight line at the time. And what they did was they had a group of pilots and they divided them up into four different groups. The first group was the control group and this group just received the standard pilot training that was required at the time in 1976. And that also included a methodology that was called stall avoidance. In 1949 uh, the FAA uh, eliminated intentional or mandatory spin training for everyone except flight instructor applicants and the move was then towards stall avoidance and this is where the the saying no stall no spin came from it came from the stall avoidance methodology so this control group that's all they received the standard training with the stall avoidance methodology the second group was a uh, experimental ground school group and of course they still received the standard pilot training uh, with the stall avoidance methodology, but they also received a, a new 90-page handbook that was put together that talked about more detail on spin dynamics and, and stall dynamics and accident scenarios that can lead to inadvertent stall spins, a lot more on the aerodynamic side as well. Plus, they also received three additional hours of ground instruction, two hours of which were lecture on uh, stall spin phenomenon, the FAA put together a half an hour movie that they watched as well and then there was a half an hour period of questions and answers. The third group was the stall avoidance uh, and incipient spins group. Again, they received the standard pilot training. Uh, they also received the new 90 page handbook, the three additional hours of lecture movie question and answers and they also added in two new hours of flight training. So on airplane experience, in the airplane hands-on install avoidance, install awareness. Typical scenarios that might lead a pilot through distraction and other other things that are going on in and around the cockpit while we're flying that could lead to inadvertent stall spins. We have uh, trim stalls, we have uh, gliding, simulated engine fares to glides with gliding turns and, and other types of scenarios like that that might occur in the traffic pattern. And then we have this the fourth group which was the spin training group. Standard pilot training, the new 90 page handbook, three hours of lecture movie question and answer, two hours of the uh, stall avoidance which is really the the situational awareness or the risk management uh, side of the training and this group then received an additional 25 minutes of intentional spin training 
with intentional spins up to two turns. So not only were they doing the in-airplane stall avoidance, which we'll call the situational awareness training, uh, scenario-based training, but also 25 minutes of intentional spins, which we can consider the maneuver-based training. Well, throughout this whole process, the, uh, the FAA identified critical traffic pattern operations that are likely to lead pilots into trouble if we become distracted uh, from our primary mission of flying the airplane. And as we might expect, all of our stall spin awareness comes into play in one trip around the pattern. We're close to the ground, we're low, we're slow, multiple configuration changes, we're sequencing in with traffic, we might have to be communicating with other pilots in air traffic control. And so a whole lot of things are going on. We're moving up away from the ground, down close to the ground, a lot of things going on dealing with the winds. On the departure phase, we might have the uh, short field takeoff where we're trying to, to uh, clear an obstacle at the end of the airport, trying to get our best angle of climb, VX, uh, to get the most altitude gained in the shortest uh, horizontal distance. And in most light airplanes, the margin between VX and the 1G wings level stall speed is pretty small. It doesn't take much of a of a hiccup in, in terms of our reaction on the uh, sticker of the yoke to be right there at the critical angle of attack. And in, in this particular case, maybe there's density altitude, we're not as proficient in the airplane, uh, and other, other factors going on as well. Maybe we're not exactly on the speed we want to be, and that object or that obstacle is looming in front of us. And in our attempt to try to get over it, nurse the airplane over it, we continue to apply back pressure until we have an inadvertent stall. Also, we might have the potential for an engine failure on takeoff or climb out. And once the engine fails, if, we're, if we don't promptly lower the nose to a best glide attitude uh, and start the airplane, start the energy moving forward again, uh, if we pull instead, we can have a high sink rate, inadvertent stall spin, or if we attempt to turn back to the runway and botch the turn, uh, we also risk a stall spin departure. Well, if we may, do make it into the pattern, maybe Maybe it's our turn to be the fast airplane in the pattern. We've just upgraded um, to something faster than we're used to flying. And of course, in front of us, there's the slow airplane. And so maybe we're, we're, we have a fear or a sense that we're overtaking slower traffic in front. Um, maybe we're having to throttle way back and slow the airplane way down. Perhaps we're having to uh, execute some S turns. Maybe we're told to execute a 360 for spacing. And in this whole process, we become distracted uh, engrossed with the airplane that we're following to the point where maybe we lose touch of what we're doing with our own airplane and inadvertently stall the airplane in the process. If we make it through the pattern and we're now turning base to final, we have the, the classic cross-control turn from base to final. And in this scenario, perhaps the pilot was just flying maybe a closer downwind than normal, maybe flying a faster airplane than they're used to, uh, just over uh, misjudged the turn base to final. Perhaps they picked up a tailwind on the base leg. All of that pushes them beyond the uh, extended center line, and they feel compelled, instead of perhaps leveling the wings and going around, they feel compelled to try to hurry that turn back to the center line, misapply inputs, and inadvertently stall or spin the airplane. And let's spend a moment and, and kind of look at and delve into the mechanics of this classic skid spin. So we have the little uh, airplane demonstration here, and let's all imagine that we're in a left-hand turn in the pattern coming from base to final. And of course, we're in, in slow flight in this particular case. We fly more left patterns than right, so that should be familiar to most of us. We also have the engine effects from slow flight, which favor a left departure. We've got the, the torque P factor and slipstream involved here. So the pilot overshoots the runway center line, and they feel, again, compelled to try to rush the uh, airplane back back to the center line, but they don't want to increase the bank angle because they understand that that stall speed goes up and there are there, there could be issues with increasing the bank. So instead, they'll start applying the rudder. In this case, left rudder. It's also called bottom rudder. It's the rudder in the direction of the turn to try to, to circle that nose back around. The problem is as soon as they apply that left rudder, the response from the airplane is for the nose to slice downward through the horizon. And our natural instinct when we see that happen and we're only a couple hundred feet above the ground, the nose is dropping, we're going to automatically try to pull the nose up and increase the aft, aft elevator. And so now we have this left rudder in, we're pulling back on the stick, so we've got some a yaw component uh, on the airplane. We're also increasing the angle of attack. 
perhaps right at the stall break as we get to critical angle of attack and the, the bank suddenly increases, we might even put in some opposite aileron at the break. All of these things are aggravating and the result, the outcome, is an accelerated stall spin too close to the ground for recovery. So again, if we kind of understand and are aware, maybe we don't start making these inputs which start compounding on each other. Don't skid with the rudder, which will, uh, because if we do, the likelihood is we're going to pull back and increase the angle of attack. And if the airplane departs, we're going to put in the opposite aileron. And all of these things aggravate and then culminate in the inadvertent stall spin close to the ground. Okay, so now let's say we have made it to final approach. There are a couple of issues here. Uh, perhaps we may have an engine failure or just simply poor airspeed management on the approach. Maybe we're low on the profile and uh, trying to stretch the glide or at least get the nose back up on the proper profile by pulling back uh, on the elevator. Uh, if we have an engine failure, trying to stretch the glide, all of those things uh, lead to increased uh, angle of attack and an increased stall potential. But even if we don't have a stall potential, we could be so far on the backside of the power curve that even if we're adding power to try to offset that, there's just so much drag that we get a high sink rate anyway. And maybe it's not a stall departure, but the airplane contacts the ground in a high sink rate, an accident that's called a mush accident. So, so not only a stall spin potential, but in this case, there's another type of accident called a mush high sink rate. So now we might have to do a go around, and go arounds have their own set of uh, issues that we need to be aware of. One is the trim effect. And in a conventional, uh, a classic single engine airplane, we might be trimmed for a, a low speed approach at low power, but now we're gonna add full power to do the go around. That slipstream on the tail increases the trim effect. And if we're not ready and prepared to offset that increased trim pressure, the trim itself can pitch the airplane to an increased angle of attack and possibly a, a stall departure or maybe even settling back down to the ground through some kind of a mush uh, with a high drag even though we have high power. Premature flap retraction, maybe some of us have experienced that. If there are instructors in the audience, I'm sure uh, you've had it happen to you if not doing it to yourself, uh, where we initiate the go around, we're offsetting the nose up trim effect, but we reach over and we slap up the uh, flap handle all at once. The flaps come up, the airplane sinks down. And as it sinks, our instinct is to start pulling more, which exacerbates the sink and possibly takes us to a critical angle of attack. Best strategy with flaps, whether we're retracting them or adding them, is to move the flaps in increments, one notch at a time, whether it's up or down, so that with each notch, we're maintaining positive control of the airplane. And then, of course, we have the go around from a slip. Uh, perhaps we're using the slip to counteract a crosswind. And the critical one would be a slip uh, to counteract a right crosswind. So imagine yourself coming in, going to use a right wing low method because you've got a right uh, crosswind and you're still tracking down the center line of the runway. So you're coming in at low power and now you have to initiate a go around. So look at the configuration we're in. We're going to start adding the power in, which adds torque p-factor slip, uh, slipstream, left turning tendencies in most of the airplanes that we're flying. Uh, we've also got some left rudder in, perhaps some net left rudder because we were tracking the center line in our right wing low slip uh, to, to offset the drift. And as the airplane is gaining speed, we're going to probably transition from the right wing low slip to maybe something less than that, or maybe even try to move over to a crab angle during the uh, go around. And so we can see we have the engine effects, torque P factor slipstream to the left, perhaps a little bit of net left rudder, perhaps some roll component that we're adding to the left. So everything is favoring a left departure if the airplane were to stall. When we know that as we transition from the slip attitude to the go around attitude, ultimately we're gonna have to switch the rudder to right rudder for the slow flight effects during the uh, high power takeoff or the go around. So if we mismanage that whole process, which is a complicated process, uh, we run the risk of inadvertently stalling and possibly spinning the airplane, and this would be from right wing low through wings level to left wing low. That's called an over-the-top spin departure, if that were to happen. So the best strategy there, if you have to go around, first of all, use good judgment and decide to go around early enough while you have lots of options available to you. Uh, and don't feel like you have to press all of these things together into some weird mashup of control inputs to make it all happen. Perhaps if we're early enough in the go around process, just simply take the slip out and then power up and do the go around. Do one step followed by the next step. That might be a more effective strategy to maintain positive control of the airplane. 
Okay, and of course the first rule in aviation, we're always taught uh, aviate, navigate, communicate. That, that's the priorities, otherwise known as fly the airplane. And what we really mean by fly the airplane is we, we always need to give the wing what it needs. And we have to satisfy the aerodynamic needs of the wing. And typically, in a worst case scenario, that always means trying to get the airflow back on as much of the wing as we can possibly do. Okay, so now let's jump back to the uh, stall awareness study and let's see what some of the results were. And what they did in this study, they did two evaluation flights with all of the pilots in the study. Uh, before they divided everybody up, they did an evaluation flight and they simply put them through different scenarios with multiple distractions and a lot of things going on. And the evaluator simply counted up throughout the flight profile how many inadvertent stalls there were, how many inadvertent spins there were, and of course, how many times the evaluator had to drop the clipboard out of self-preservation and recover the spin him or herself. Then they went through the training increments and then did a second evaluation flight, went through the flight profile, again, counting up accidental stalls, accidental spins, how many times the evaluator had to take over. Well, in the case of how, how the additional training impacted the uh, frequency of accidental stalls, interestingly enough, more stall training made no difference whatsoever. In other words, the accidental stall rate of groups one and two was identical to groups three and four. And so groups one and two, remember, group one didn't receive any additional training other than the stall avoidance methodology. Group two, all they received was some additional ground training, some chalk talk basically, discussion, but no hands-on experience. Groups three and four, they went out and did the extra air work, two hours of scenario-based uh, training related to stall spin awareness, and group four actually did spin training. And yet, all of these groups were still just as likely to inadvertently stall. And that might seem initially a little counterintuitive, but if you think about it, it makes sense. Because there is no way in most of the airplanes we're flying to ever know with a high degree of certainty how close we are to critical angle of attack. Now we can guess, we can approximate based on airspeed and G-load trends, our practical experience and everything like that, but there's no way that we, we are directly measuring in most of the airplanes that, that we have. So at best it's always a guess, best guess in a lot of cases. Now with the FAA's current uh, emphasis on encouraging the use of supplemental angle of attack, well now we might have a, a better measure. Whether or not angle of attack in the general aviation context will prove to be beneficial uh, is still yet to be seen. There are research programs underway right now to test the current generation of angle of attack indication uh, devices in training environments to see, okay, does it really have the dividend, the safety dividend that we think it might. But if, we're not, if we don't have that or if the research comes back a different way, well, we're still stuck with basically trying to use our, our best guess. So from that standpoint, it makes sense that additional training is not going to help us be more precise in knowing where the critical angle of attack is. But here's where it gets even more interesting. So, okay, we're still just as likely to have an accidental stall, but what did the additional training do? against the accidental spin. In other words, did the pilots, were they as likely, more likely, less likely, even though they might stall the airplane, to allow it to progress to the next level, to escalate from a stall to a spin? Well, groups one and two worsened by 50%. In other words, they had more accidental spins on the second evaluation flight than they did on the first. That kind of makes sense too. Group one, they received no additional training. They went out, did an evaluation flight. Perhaps some of them got a little uh, nervous and scared based on that experience. So what do you think is going to happen on the second evaluation flight? None of those issues were addressed. They were just put back in the environment and said, here, let's do that again. So the heightened stress or the anxiety from having a negative experience the first time drove perhaps the likelihood of having that occur again. And you can imagine that because the pilot is nervous and perhaps stressed about it, um, they're actually driven to do the thing that they're hoping they're not going to do again. Uh, same with group two. All, they, all group two did was receive a little bit of uh, attaboy, this is what happened, and we had, we had our lecture and everything else, but they didn't have any tactile experience to try to resolve the, uh, the accidental spin departures the first time. So they worsened 50%. 
Group th three that received the additional uh, two hours in flight with the uh, stall spin awareness scenario based training, they had an improvement of 33%, pretty significant against the accidental spin. Group four, the spin training group, they didn't have a single accidental spin on the second evaluation flight. And yet, it seems year after year, there will always be the debate about the benefits of spin training. This is an FAA study that drove a lot of the subsequent training requirements that have come down since 1976, except for mandating spin training, a lot of reasons why that's a wise thing not to have done. But these results speak for themselves. So why don't we refer back to the FAA's own study if we're going to try to debate the merits of spin training. All right, so the real culprit when we talk about departing from the stall to the spin is excess yaw. If we've got yaw at the stall, that's what's going to drive the spin. And of course, yaw comes from a lot of places. Adverse yaw, if you move the ailerons around, you're going to have some adverse yaw effects. Those effects are greater in some designs than others. Some aircraft come with interconnects between the aileron and the rudder where the manufacturers sort of built in some rudder deflection for you uh, just to reduce some of your workload when you deflect the ailerons. Torque P-factor slipstream, engine effects, we could also throw into that mix perhaps some gyroscopic effects uh, as well. And then we have rigging effects. Airplanes are rigged, typically rigged, so that they can fly hands and feet off in level cruise flight. Well, if we pitch the nose up and we get slower and slower away from cruise flight, higher and higher power settings, we need more and more right rudder pressure in the typical airplane. If we push the nose downhill and start gaining speed beyond the uh, level flight, uh, cruise flight speed, then we have just the opposite effect. We're probably going to need some more and more left rudder pressure uh, in a high speed descent. And then, of course, we have our own improper footwork. What is the pilot doing, or in some cases not doing, uh, in terms of canceling yaw? The skidded turn is a classic example of doing too much with the rudder that's not needed. Uh, other cases would be not applying, uh, applying sufficient rudder that might be needed, say during a climb out, not having enough right rudder in. And so stall spin awareness, if we go ahead and think of it in those terms, really has to do with what's, what's going on with our yaw awareness. And again, the FAA study showed that still likely to inadvertently stall the airplane, but if we're paying attention to the yaw part of it, we can avoid that from, uh, keep that from escalating to the inadvertent spin departure while hopefully we address the stall, lower the angle of attack, and reattach the airflow. So with this in mind, I'm going to kick it back over to Billy, and he's going to run a little poll. Is the slip skid ball always reliable? Okay, Rich, let me uh, start a poll here for us. Okay, is the slip skid ball always reliable? Everybody, please weigh in. Um, you should see a poll on your screen, and let's vote. Come along nicely, a third of us already. Half, great. Thank you. Give it a few more seconds. And we got about 95 percent have participated. So let's uh, let's see what the results are, Rich. Okay. There you have it, Rich. What do you think of that? Good. All right. Well, 57 percent, uh, just slightly more than half. So. Let's go ahead and uh, I ha give me control again, and we'll move on to the next part. Okay, you should have control. Okay, so I have control. So given the first question, which was a poll question, let's take a quiz now. Uh, the correct answer is yes, the slip skid ball is not always reliable. So the 57% were correct on that. We'd like to get that number much closer to 100%. So with that in mind, what issues can affect slip skid ball indications? Back over to you, Billy. Okay, let me launch it for you. That should be up. What issues can affect slip skid ball indications? Everybody, please weigh in. Coming along nicely. We'll give it a few more seconds here. Great participation. Thank you. Okay, we've got about 90%, Rich. Let's see what everybody's up to. Okay, 
What do you think, Rich? That's excellent. Eighty uh, percent chose all of the above, and that is correct. And we'll we'll discuss why that is. Okay. Back to you. All right. I have controls. So like all the instruments in the airplane, the slip skid ball suffers from lag. And it sits in a little curved piece of glass that's got a viscous fluid in it. Otherwise, it would be way overly sensitive to, to yawing movements. So because it sits in a viscous fluid, there is a little bit of lag. When, when we're in the process of dynamically changing things with the airplane, uh, the ball will have a little bit of lag to it. The other limitation is bank angle. So here are two slip skid indicators uh, put in the cockpit of the same airplane. Uh, the top one would be simulating, well, 180 degrees of bank from where the bottom one is. And if you notice there, uh, once we get beyond a certain bank angle, well, the ball falls off of the curved glass. It falls off the hump. So it's not going to be a reliable once we exceed a certain bank angle. Uh, by the way, there is usually a little air bubble that lives inside of these indicators that usually don't reveal themselves until you go upside down. Uh, you could use the, the bubble like a carpenter's level or a spirit level when you're flying upside down, although I would suggest that if you are flying an airplane upside down, please look outside, don't look at the slip skid indicator. So ultimately, the slip skid indicator suffers from lag, just like all of our instruments when we're dynamically maneuvering the airplane. There is a bank angle limit beyond which it's not going to be able to give us a good indication. And it is never reliable when we're during, uh, doing a spin. So the slip skid ball, totally unreliable while spinning. So all of the above is the correct answer regarding the slip skid indicator. So with that in mind, how do we sense yaw in visual conditions when we're, when we're flying in uh, VMC conditions? And the bulk of light airplane flying is done in day VFR conditions. And so that's a different environment. That's called a contact environment. We're looking outside. We're, we're, we're getting visual references. Uh, and in that case, our senses can be used accurately to give us indications, particularly about yaw. Now, when we're in, a, in an IMC environment, that's a totally different environment. Uh, we, we have to learn to squelch what our senses are telling us and trust the instruments. But when we're visual, sight is perfectly valid. Uh, way to sense yaw. Here's a, a simple thing that you can do next time you're flying in the practice area. Put the airplane, give it some power, put it in a simulated climb as if you're taking off from a runway up at altitude. Get the airplane all nice and coordinated, squared up, and then simply release your feet off the rudder pedals. Take the pressure out of the rudder pedals. And you should see in most of the airplanes we're flying that the nose will start to move across the horizon to the left. Well, we can see that. that. That is torque, P factor, and slipstream. And then if you put your foot back on, you can push that nose right back to where it came from. So we can see yaw by doing that. We can also hear it in a lot of cases. So take a Cessna 172 as an example. If you start yawing the airplane, you'll notice that the sound when you're in a slip, as an example, gets deeper and throatier. And if you get enough yaw angle in some of the Cessnas, uh, you'll actually hear it growl at you. The prop, uh, the airflow coming off the prop uh, will growl at you a little bit. Totally different sound from coordinated flight. And then, of course, we have feel, the seat of the pants part of it. Do I feel heavier on one side of my seat versus the other side? Well, there may be a, a yaw issue. Of course, feel only works if you're relaxed in the airplane, if you're tense, you're fighting the airplane, you, you lose your sense of feel. So learning to relax so you can feel those changes just like the ball might show you as well. So sight, sound, feel. And then, of course, there's aeronautical knowledge. We know in most airplanes, like a Cessna 172, before we ever get in it, before we ever advance the throttle and rotate and take off, we know we're going to need right rudder. So what are we waiting for? Now it's just a matter of figuring out how much right rudder, that's where the sight, the sound, the feel, maybe integrated with a ball indication can tell us. But we want to integrate all of these things together to become more precise and more yaw aware. And if three or four of the indications are telling us one thing, well, I think we need to go with the majority uh, indications at that point. So let's take a moment and review wing stall patterns. In this case, uh, what you're seeing here is a, a basic rectangular plan form. The fuselage is on the left side. The wing tip is on, the, uh, correction, fuselage is on the right side. The uh, wing tip is on the left. Uh, the aileron is the lightly shaded uh, portion there. And then you see the squiggly lines. That's separated airflow. 
we're simulating now a, a an, an idealized case, um, kind of a perfect world scenario, uh, in a rectangular plan form in a power off stall. And those plan forms are designed to stall, or they will stall at the wing root first. Several benefits. One is we have lateral control longer. The ailerons will remain more or less effective until the stall migrates further down that wing. But also by stalling at the wing root first, that lumpy air as it spills off of the wing hits the back end of the airplane, the fuselage, the tail section, and gives us warning. That's the classic stall buffet that we talk about. So we get that inherently uh, in a power off stall with the rectangular plan form. We also get the most docile stall characteristics. So as long as we're with, within weight and balance, uh, the airplane in this case not only will give us the warning in terms of buffet, but the nose will naturally want to pitch to a lower angle of attack. So it's trying to fix itself. It's self-correcting. Unfortunately, a lot of times when pilots are in the airplane and the nose pitches down, the pilot reacts to the nose down attitude by continuing to try to pull the nose up, which defeats uh, the reattachment of the airflow on the wing. So a lot of times we fight against things that the airplane is trying to do to fix itself. So and that's, in this case, we need to learn to also relax our back pressure as well. And again, this is idealized surface contamination or dimples and dents on the wing could kind of change where the stall is actually occurring. But this is kind of a, a nice review of an idealized case. If we move to a higher performance plan form, uh, one that's got a little bit of a moderate taper to it, Good news is we can get a little higher performance on the cruise uh, end of things. The, the downside is there's always a trade-off. If, if we're going to get a benefit somewhere aerodynamically, it's, it's going to show up as a penalty somewhere else. The penalty is it tends to stall simultaneously throughout the wingspan. And when it does that, we might not get the good warning that we get in a rectangular plan form with the power off. Uh, we might lose our aileron authority, lateral control lost earlier in the stall process and tends to be a little bit more aggressive behavior, uh, less docile stall characteristics. And as a result, what, what airplane designers do is they try to fool the wing. At one end, okay, we want to get the performance in the cruise side of it, so we're going to give it a moderately tapered plan form, but then we'll do some certain tricks and things so that we still try to get back to the high angle attack end that's, that mimics more of a rectangular plan form. And a couple of those tricks might involve something as simple as, a, as an aluminum stall fan. So basically, pick up a piece of extra aluminum that's, that's laying on the floor, let's put it on the top of the wing out where the aileron begins, and it acts as a literal barrier to the stall progression down the wing so that we maintain our lateral control a little bit longer. Uh, we might also have a stall wedge on the wing, a uh, leading edge, or a stall strip. Those are designed to make sure or ensure that the stall occurs at a particular place on the wing, typically inboard because then we get the, those same characteristics of a rectangular plan form, but not always inboard. We might even put vortex generators on our primary wing, and the vortex generators act like metal stall fences. They throw little invisible tornadoes over the wing, and those invisible tornadoes resist the migration of stall down the wing toward the aileron. We might also have slots in the wing, or uh, airplanes like the Cirrus and the Columbia will have a different, uh, they'll have a leading edge cuff outboard that's at a slightly different angle of attack than the inboard part of the wing. So a lot of different tricks. We can twist the wing, give it different, slightly different angles of attack, inboard versus outboard. All right, so now we have a uh, swept plan form. Um, very highly maneuverable. Uh, that's why they're on uh, jet aircraft, high speed flight. St but unfortunately, the stall tends to begin out at the wing tip first. And you can imagine if it starts there, that, that separated airflow is never going to hit the fuselage. So we're not going to get any warning. At the same time, we're going to lose our aileron control immediately. And if you picture the rest of this wing in this picture is still making lift, uh, but because we've lost portion of that wing, the, the outer aft portion, the center of lift is starting to move forward on that wing. And if it gets far enough forward that it's ahead of the center of gravity, we have an aggressive stall with a pitch up. And so we've gone from a rectangular plan form, which will inherently, as long as we're within weight and balance, inherently self-correct, want to go to a lower angle attack, to this type of plan form, which will inherently want to pitch up to an even deeper, higher angle attack and a deeper stall, which may, in some cases, be unrecoverable. 
All right, so let's take a poll. We're going to move now to uh, talking about spiral stalls and spins, and there's usually a lot of confusion about spirals, so let's get that cleared up right away. What four words accurately describe spirals in their broadest sense, the broadest sense? Billy, over to you. Okay, let's launch a poll for you. Okay, what four words accurately describe spirals in their broadest sense? Here they come. Give it a few more seconds, but people are jumping on it. A couple more seconds. We're about three fourths there. Okay, we're about ninety percent. So let me share that with you, Rich. Okay. What do you make of that? All right, it's a, a, a very good uh, mix here, um, but 51% just barely made it, got the right answer. Turning with changing altitude. Here's the thing about a spiral. In its broadest sense, it's simply a turn where the altimeter changes. And so we can imagine in one trip around the traffic pattern, we do some climbing spirals to get up the pattern altitude, we do some descending spirals, get down to the runway. And so they can be controlled spirals, ascending, descending, and of course they can be out of control spirals. And that's what we're really going to talk about next, are the descending spirals that get out of whack on us, where we lose control of our G-load and our airspeed, perhaps even our bank angle. And we'll call these particular spirals spiral dives. And so let's have a look. What's the difference between spiral stalls and spins? From an angle of attack perspective, spirals occur below critical angle of attack. We're still in the normal flight side of the envelope. Relatively low drag compared to the uh, coefficient of lift that we're able to generate. Stalls and spins, we've exceeded critical angle of attack. Very high drag on that side of the curve. And the airflow is separated as well. If we have a look at the uh, airspeed indications, the spirals, again, spiral dives where things are getting out of whack, will typically have a rapidly increasing airspeed trend. Again, we're below critical angle attack, so drag's not really building up uh, exponentially like it does on the uh, stalled side of things, and so airspeed can build up quite rapidly. Stalls and spins, because it's such a high drag configuration, relatively low and constant. So we're not going to see the acceleration in the airspeed indicator in a stall or spin like we might in a spiral. If we look at the G-load, well, how's that feel on our bodies in the spirals? Typically, uh, all turns, the one of the characteristics is in a turn, we have G in the spiral. As, as we start to lose control and speed gets out of whack and we start pulling harder and harder, uh, the G-load trend will increase. We'll feel heavier and heavier in our seats. When we talk about upright stalls and spins, they're essentially 1G maneuvers. They don't feel any different than we do sitting where we are right now. So totally different mechanisms, totally different aerodynamic reasons driving the spirals versus stalls and spins. And so knowing this, we can then move on and, and kind of identify where we're going to go with the recovery procedures. Primary driver in a spiral is, is not that we're not pulling hard enough on the elevator, but it's the bank angle is too large. Excessive angle of bank is typically the problem. Stalls, of course, we've got an excessive angle of attack. We've exceeded the critical number. In spins, not only did we exceed critical angle of attack, but we've allowed yaw and roll coupling. And all that means is that in an upright spin, if I'm yawing to the left, the airplane is also rolling to the left. So those two things are working together to drive the rotation of the spin. And so with that in mind, we can now come up uh, with a review of how we're going to deal with each of these. In the spirals, it's a banking problem. So aileron is our primary recovery control. And here's how I'd like you to think about recovering from any turn that goes awry that you don't like. Power, push, roll. As far as the power is concerned, in a descending spiral, a spiral dive, take the power off. That'll just help slow the process down a little bit for us. Push. A little bit of forward pressure on the stick or the yoke. Let's unload the wing. Let's reduce the G load a little bit. And then the main action, shallow the bank. Roll a lot. Lots of aileron. A little bit of coordinating rudder with that if, if you want, if you want some extra style points. But basically, shallow the bank. Power, push, roll. Power off, 
push forward just a little bit, get back maybe to a 1G environment, roll, shallow the bank. And so with that in mind, let's take another quiz. What potential benefits arise, do you, can you think, would arise from the push in power push roll? Billy? Okay, let's launch this one. Now we'll point out that uh, there was a typo, Rich, in the last one that uh, should have said altitude, but actually we typed in attitude. So everybody's feeling crying unfair. <laughs> so we, we, I think probably more people got it right than we gave them credit for. And that's probably my fault for production. And so sorry, folks, but hopefully we get this one right. Here, I'll launch it. Okay, what potential benefits arise from the push in power push role? So please weigh in. Okay, thank you. Well over half, 70, 80%. Give it a few more seconds. Okay, I'll close it out and we'll see what we have here, Rich. Okay, Rich? Yeah, that's uh, fantastic, 74%, uh, all of the above, all of the above. So, so certainly the push, always a push when we're in positive G flight, gives us a lower angle of attack. Now we have more, a little more stall margin. Uh, the push also gives us a little bit lower G load, which is good not only on our bodies, but from a structural standpoint on the airplane. And then, of course, since the spiral is a turn, and a characteristic of the turn is that we're we're curving the flight path with the G, with the aft elevator, releasing some of that G loosens up the turn. We get a little bit bigger turn out of it, a little slower turn rate, a little larger radius. So all of these things, even though the push is a small input, it has a lot of nice little perks on our way to shallowing the bank. All right, so stalls. Let's move on here. Elevator is the primary recovery control. Elevator controls angle of attack. The stall problem is excessive angle. And here's how I like to think of it. Maintain heading and wings level with rudder inputs while you're in the throes of dealing with a stall. Maintain heading and wings level with rudder inputs. Leave the ailerons out of the equation. Lower the angle attack with elevator. Remember what they uh, concluded back in 1912 in Parks Dive. It has to do with elevator and rudder actions only. Well, here we see it. Rudder inputs keep everything straight. Lower the angle attack with the elevator, and you don't have to push so far on the elevator that everybody starts floating in the cockpit. Just enough to reattach the airflow is all you need. Um, if we had a, a very precise uh, AOA indicator in the airplane, if the wing stalls at 15 degrees, it's unstalled at 14. So we don't have to get carried away enough to get the job done. Once the airflow is attached, now we have normal use of all the controls. So we can bring ailerons back on board once we're back on the uh, normal side of critical angle of attack. And think of it like this, the nose of the airplane and the stick of the control wheel has to, have to move in the same direction. Imagine the last time you did a power off stall in the practice area, wings level. So you're applying back pressure, the, the yoke is coming toward you, the nose of the airplane is coming toward you. Right at the stall break, you might get that little bit of buffet and the nose starts pitching toward your feet. Well, you got to move the stick or yoke forward as well. They have to be working in concert. If the nose pitches down, but you pull back, they're in opposition, and the airplane stays in the stall. So get those two things working together. All right, let's move on to the spins. And typical light uh, uh, GA single engine airplanes. I know that's a mouthful, but believe it or not, that's about 75% of the GA fleet out there. So we're not being exclusive by uh, putting that caveat on there. Rudder is the primary recovery control. Once we cross the line from a stall where elevator is primary and rudder is in a secondary role to keep everything straight, once we cross that line, now the rudder becomes primary. And think of it this way, P-A-R-E, pair. Uh, that's our spin recovery checklist like GUMPS or CIGARS or any of the other uh, acronyms that we might use. And it really follows along with the NASA standard spin recovery. And if you remember what they published, uh, McAvoy published in 36 with the power off and the ailerons neutral. So here it is, power off, ailerons neutral. Apply full opposite rudder. There it is, followed by forward elevator. So we're talking about upright stalls and spins, power off, ailerons neutral, 
full opposite rudder, hold it in till the spin is done, and then don't wait to do the elevator. This is a four-step procedure to get to the recovery, not three and wait to see what's going to happen. Power's off, aileron's neutral, full opposite rudder, hold it in, move the elevator forward. When the spin stops, relax, neutralize the rudder, and return to level flight. Another simple way to try to remember this, if anybody speaks Portuguese in the audience, P-A-R-E is Portuguese for stop, and we definitely want our spins to stop, and this is the best way uh, to make that happen. All right, so at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Billy to discuss what's next, and then we'll open up for some uh, questions and answers. Billy? Great, Rich. Thanks. That was outstanding. Really appreciate it. So let me pull this back. I can tell you... The uh, questions have been um, really coming in, and uh, while I'm turning the screen over, but I'm going to tell folks, you know, a little bit more about what you're up to. But uh, one of the questions that uh, is coming up, something to think about before we get there, is is angle of attack, and particularly the uh, indicators, and uh, which ones you prefer in that instance. So think about that. Uh, well, let's share what else you're up to here, Rich, um, before we get to the Q&A. Um, again, everybody, you can go to uh, learntofly.com and you can see more about this, but there are a couple more webinars. There's one actually next Tuesday evening um, that you'll find on Learn Do Fly that's, that's free. And there are a couple of more that come after that that are uh, a little more exclusive and a little more interesting in terms of materials and things that you get out of them, but they're also uh, WINGS approved, and, and those are coming up uh, next week and the week after. And then Rich is leading a course online that he's done quite often uh, in front of people, but this is the first time that we've actually done it in an online session. It'll be quite interesting. That's his emergency maneuver training course. So. Again, look on learndofly.com. Uh, for those in the D.C. area, like ourselves here and out uh, north of San Francisco and Nevada, there are a couple of seminars that Rich is participating in. Uh, and uh, seminars are followed by actually two or three days of actually flying with Rich. And you could have that opportunity. And Rich will be here next week uh, to do that with us. So, again, you can look on learndofly.com. Uh, um, another thing that Rich is doing that's very interesting is that uh, we're not ready for this yet, but we've got six partners uh, that are going to be showcasing some scenarios that we've developed that correspond to the material that Rich has been going over tonight and will in his subsequent webinars. And uh, you'll literally be able to get in the simulator and really start to apply a lot of the theory that uh, that Rich has done. We had done this with... Uh, the uh, EAA at their Air Venture Pilot Proficiency Center. It's a very similar program, except this is spread around the entire country. So you'll be hearing more about that. Uh, the other opportunity is not just flying with Rich, but also flying with uh, the flight training network uh, that's in place that's using Rich's syllabus for emergency maneuver training and some of the uh, uh, aerobatic uh, elements that he has in his courses. So. While it's first prize to go to McCall and, and train for Rich or wait for him to come to you, in the meantime, you might be able to find a more convenient location and you can take advantage of this. So thanks again. And Rich, uh, again, several questions, but angle of attack has probably, uh, probably been probably one of the more popular and grouped together. I guess it's kind of a two-part question. Number one, what do you think of angle attack indicators? And two, uh, of the two or three different types that are pretty popular out there, which which one do you favor and why? Okay, uh, yeah, a couple of good questions, especially especially given the FAA's current uh, push and incentives to encourage people to put in supplemental angles of attack. Let me start by saying that uh, oftentimes whenever new technology comes out, there's research done to show the benefits of the technology, uh, and then the recommendations are made. Uh, in this particular case, in the GA case, it seems that, that 
most people looked at the military and the airline applications and then tried to extrapolate that, well, if it works, if it's, if it's good and, and increases safety in those environments, that it would exactly do the same thing in the GA environment. And unfortunately, there were several studies done by the FAA and NASA uh, incorporating angle of attack indication into primary flight training back in the late 60s, early 70s, and the results of those studies, there are at least uh, three to four that I'm aware of, uh, were actually mixed. There were some operations, flight operations, where angle of attack was uh, beneficial, uh, and then others where it really made no difference. So uh, in my mind, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that the new research using the new generation of angle of attack uh, with a different mounting position in the airplane than the old studies uh, will yield some positive results. Uh, but I'm waiting for I'm waiting for that information to come out. Uh, in terms of what types, I don't have a lot of experience flying different types. Uh, the airplanes that I'm operating, uh, aerobatic type airplanes, uh, we have enough noise and buzzers going off without having angle of attack indication as well. Uh, although I did uh, I did have a little bit of exposure to uh, the uh, the King uh, uh, the King indicator, and it seems seems like a nice uh, unit, well built. Um, so I can't really make any particular recommendation, but I will say this as well, compared to the airline and the, and the military environments where, you know, there isn't the same type of real diversity in the equipment as we see in general aviation, um, we can fly all kinds of different types of airplanes. We have that kind of access. And also, two angle of attack indications, what you might get on a Pilatus PC-12 uh, a multi-million dollar single engine airplane, the type of angle of attack system there is going to be a totally different type than say on a, on a small home built. So the PC-12 is a good example, has a very robust system. Um, I would say military, certainly airline grade. It's got angle of attack uh, booms on each wing uh, with sensing vanes. Each vein is attached to its own computer. Either computer, when it talks to the uh, glass panel inside, can, uh, can initiate the stall warning. Both computers have to agree to activate the stick pusher that's in this airplane. Uh, by contrast, you know, maybe another type airplane, a small little home built, could have just a very simple, basic pressure port system. So regardless of what type that you might consider putting in, you also need to understand what are the limitations in the system. Everything has limitations. Uh, there is no one magic bullet that's going to solve all of the stall and spin issues. And if you go in with the mindset that you're going to use angle of attack indication as one more tool in a toolbox that you filled with all kinds of other elements that you can bring to bear to uh, maximize your, your stall spin situational awareness, great. If you're looking for angle of attack to replace all the other tools, uh, I would say perhaps reconsider, reconsider that type of mindset because then it becomes uh, like uh, the old saying, if the only tool you have is a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. We need lots of tools at our disposal, not just one. Okay, Billy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, another popular question. Um, Configuring an uh, aircraft, the basic the uh, linkage between aileron and rudder, it goes way back in history, but also you've seen it in modern times. What are the, the benefits and disadvantages of a system like that in your mind? Yeah, sure. And, and one of the one of the early airplanes, uh, the the Pacers and Tri Pacers, just had a very simple bungee uh, interconnect. Uh, so the benefit, uh, all of these types of benefits of, of the technology ultimately is to reduce some of the pilot workload. And so when you're flying in kind of a, a, a near straight and level environment or something like an instrument flight profile, making lots of small changes, keeping things pretty well close to wings level most of the time, it's nice to have a, a, an augmented system that, you know, takes some of that workload out of the inputs you have to make. And certainly that you know, compared to flying something like a J3 Cub, where every time you move the ailerons, it's going to take uh, you know significantly more rudder application than something that has some kind of an interconnect. So, so within sort of a normal pro uh, flight profile or an instrument profile, it just helps reduce some of the workload. The downside is, however, once you once you start making larger inputs, let's say you have to, or for whatever reason you're going to, uh, then you really need to bring your feet into the picture to augment the system uh, that, that's been designed in there. And the downside is that it can tend to make us a little lazier with our footwork. 
And as we saw with the uh, stall awareness study by the FAA, yes, people are still likely to, to accidentally stall their airplanes, but if they've got their feet engaged, working, and actively canceling yaw while they're in the process of recovering the stall, they won't let it escalate. So a lot of things we do in our training is uh, tends to be fairly rudder-centric. If you imagine a bell curve uh, that, that represents the frequency that people move the rudder, where the meat of that bell curve is where we should be moving the rudder, most people are at, at the far left end where they will really only move it if they have to. Uh, and so we take the approach, let's go to the other end and let's really get people engaged with the rudder. And then so we kind of bracket it and then they can work their way uh, to where they should be with it. So that, that's kind of the approach I take. Thanks, Rich. Uh, another another question from several people is, um, could you cover anything about elevator stalls? Is there anything particular about that? Yeah, typically, uh, well, an elevator stall itself might occur in, in uh, icing conditions where what they call that a tailplane stall, where you actually get enough uh, ice accretions um, to stall the elevator itself. And that might manifest itself with a, a pitch down, which might be a, the same kind of indications as a classic main wing stall. The problem with that, uh, typically that might occur in an instrument profile. And if you've got automation, autopilots, it might go undetected until you kick the autopilot off and then there's a significant uh, nose uh, down pitch. Uh, it can also be uh, aggravated by flap setting. So typically if you read about the tailplane uh, stall advice. If if you're in those kind of conditions, it'll it'll say you know, perhaps turn the automation off and, and minimize the uh, the uh, the flap setting. And I, I believe there is a, a an advisory circular by the FAA that addresses that. I th I think it's called roll upsets. Uh, I, I don't have that handy, but I can uh, Billy I, I can research that and get it to you so you can put it on the handouts board here. It does talk about that as well. Back That's to you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I guess one last popular question is um, from several people. Is there anything that uh, people would look at immediately uh, to recognize that you're about to enter into a, a significant potential spin uh, situation? Yes, uh, good, good question. Uh, the main one, of course, uh, the, the unfortunate reality is with accidental spins, 93% of accidental stall spins occur at or below traffic pattern altitude. So typically by the time it's departing, uh, the pilot's already going to hit the ground. There's, not, there's no room left over for recovery. Mm -hmm. One of the best ways to become aware is to learn to relax and let the airplane, right? The Wright brothers, remember, they gave us controllable flight. That's their legacy, their gift to us. Let the airplane fly, get out of the way. So a lot of times it's not a hardware issue, it's the software we plug into the pilot in command seat. And so if you make effective use of trim in the pattern and just leave it be, uh, the other thing that you can do, particularly if you're turning uh, downwind to base or base to final, is once you've established a turn, just give your feet a very subtle little wiggle. Wake them up. Know where they are. So the more interactive you can get, and by interactive I don't mean you're moving and the airplane's wallowing all over the sky, but just give yourself a little bit of feedback on the controls. I've got the trim set plus or minus. Feels good. I've, my feet are engaged. They're wiggling a little bit. And if you do that, you go a long way toward inducing something. Uh, the one thing that, that, that we know for sure, Anytime you hear about or read about a stall spin accident, we know one thing for sure. Somebody in the cockpit touched the controls. You could bail out of an airplane and let it fly away, and it would do a lot of different things before it came back to the ground, but it won't spin. It takes the pilot to drive that process, and it's driven by losing awareness of pulling, 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 and losing an awareness of where the feet are wake the feet up a little bit, get them a little engaged. The more stressed you are, the more you need to be aware. Am I hanging on tight to the controls? Am I pressing a rudder that I'm not aware that I'm pressing? And if you do that, that'll go a long way toward uh, prevention. Billy? Very interesting. Thank you. Um, Rich, thank you. I think we're, we kind of run a little bit over the time, and I, I respect everybody's time and everything else, but I really appreciate it. Um, I think with more questions, we may be able to put up a little bit of a um, – fact sheet on learn 
dofly.com. So I'd encourage everybody to look there for, for more feedback as well as some of the other webinars that Rich is going to be involved in. I'm sure they're going to fill up fast uh, based on tonight's attendance and registration for uh, this in the forthcoming uh, session. So, so please do go there and sign up early if you're interested. And thank you, everybody, for coming. And uh, we look at this kind of as the beginning of a community. And we're very glad that you're here. And uh, we want to keep you um, interested in all the things that we're doing. So I really appreciate it. Rich, thank you. And look forward to seeing you on the backside of Hurricane Joaquin next week. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night.